Hair TV. Today we have a amazing, amazing, wonderful show set up for you today with an amazing esteemed guest. Um, let me just give a quick hello to everyone in the chat. I hope everyone is having a wonderful, wonderful Friday. Let me go ahead and give you kind of my forewarnings. Um, as you may have heard during the intro music, I was in the background saying, today of all days, something is going on with the weather today. And so my internet is acting crazy due to the weather. So bear with us. Um, I know it's been a moment since we've seen each other and you know, there's been a lot going on and my family suffered a loss. Um, and so really I just wasn't up to going live earlier this week, you know, but I'm here with you now. I'm happy to be here. Hi to everyone in the chat. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to be here today. So for those of you who maybe are unaware, right? Uh, Michael Nowak, um, sometimes known as polite or brother polite has had a updated information filed in his case. Uh, in other words, the charges have been updated and they there have been charges added. So what we will do today is walk through the disposition chart in his case. So walk through what has happened from day one until now, and then walk through the new charges, talk about you know the potential prison time, and also break down what these charges mean as I did for you in the very, very first case review of this case. Now, some of you have asked if I will follow this case. Absolutely. I will continue to follow this case all the way through until the end, whatever that end may be. Now, on that topic, I like to say, as an attorney, I do not predict how cases will turn out. And I do not recommend that anyone online try to predict how a case will turn out either. And here is why. Cases are unpredictable, especially if this case ends up going to a jury trial. You can never predict how a jury trial will turn out. Some people are saying it is possible that he could be acquitted. Yes, those people are right. If this case is sent to a jury, a jury may look at this evidence and despite what other people think, they may think, you know what? Mm, I don't think so. You never know what could happen in a court of law. So I do not recommend anyone predicting what could happen. Now, in my professional opinion, I tell you all the different potential outcomes, but as far as forecasting an outcome, I would not do that and I do not recommend it, okay? Um, someone said their condolences to my family. Thank you so much. Um, Candy Girl says, smash that like button. I agree. If you are in the building and you're enjoying the content, please hit the like button. It is totally free. All right. So as you got a short glimpse of earlier per my, you know, stream yard foolishness, we have an esteemed guest today. He calls himself a junior elder, which, hey, you know, I think I might actually agree with. And there's not many people who can give themselves the elder title and I'll agree. Um, but I really would say that uh, the best title to give to him is a truth teller. Um, he's been as a leader online, um, telling people really the truth and the science behind a lot of pop culture issues. He's live on his channel tonight, I believe 7 p.m. California time with another riveting topic. So without further ado, everyone, welcome Chief X, also known as the guy best reincarnated. <laughs> it's, it's an honor to have you here today. We're all so um, just ecstatic to have you here. It's a real treat. Thank you for the introduction, and I'm glad to be here. You know, uh, I love your um, your teaching moments, and um, you know, I'm just glad to be here and share this stage with you, and um, put in my input when necessary, and um, um, reveal some questions to you, and. Um, I highly, highly suggest everyone that is listening to this video, share the video. Share it anywhere you want, share it in groups, share it with your friends, and um, let's have this um, discussion and talk. And, um, and um, listen to the teacher, Felicia Pearson. She does such an amazing job. And uh, when I first ran across her, I was just very, 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 very impressed 
um, with the way she conveyed the information. And um, we're going to do this today. We're going to do this today. Afrocentric Beauty says, I finally caught a live. Yay! So glad you caught us. This might be our new time, everyone, because I actually think I prefer this to Sunday. All righty. All right. So listen, we're early on in the stream and I already blocked someone. People, if you want to be here and you want to participate in the stream, please be respectful to everyone present or you'll get sent to the blocketh. And I am not the kind of person that unblocks once you are blocked, you are blocked in perpetuity. All right, shout out to Pocket Watching with JT, an awesome content creator here on YouTube. I mean, superb, okay? Thank you for the super chat. And man, I'm honored to know that I'm one of your faves. What an honor. All I right. love Pocket Watching with JT. Oh, I love him. I love him. And also, he's my frat. So, hey, frat, how you doing? So, let's jump into the Miami Dade Clerk's Office and their record of what has happened in this case. After that, we will dive into these new charges, okay? All right, so you guys know per usual, for some reason I tend to announce when I'm sharing my screen, why? I don't know, I just do. So share screen, here we are. Miami-Dade County Clerk of the Courts, right? Criminal Justice Online System. You see all this information in the beginning. You see Michael Nowak. You see the date this case was initiated, right? All this stuff that lets you know you're looking at the case that you're actually trying to look for, okay? So let's go past charges for a moment and let's just go here to docket, right? This is the docket report. So you can start from the very beginning here, August 17th. August 17th, you see a charging document was filed, right? And so an arraignment hearing was scheduled for September 15th. They have that it was assigned to the intake unit for these certain types of crimes, right? They have that a prosecutor was assigned by the name of Nicole Garcia, right? And then they also have that a Mr. Adam Rosen Esquire was given a notice of the hearing as he is the defense attorney of record in this case. August 18th, demand for discovery, probably filed by Mr. Rosen or Rosen, right? Um, because it is commonplace for a criminal defense attorney to file a motion to dismiss, as you see here, and a demand for discovery right away. Sometimes that is referred to as an omnibus motion, right? It's an all encompassing motion, but it is commonplace for the minute a defense attorney is retained, they say, all right, let me file my demands. Let me file my motion to dismiss. Now here's the thing. Do they think that the case will actually be dismissed? Maybe not, but to protect themselves from malpractice, it is commonplace for every criminal defense attorney to file a motion to dismiss. Because even if they don't think they could actually win it, a client can later on turn around and say, you never filed one and I think we could have won it. And so I think that's malpractice. Right. And then that attorney could end up tied up in court trying to explain why they did not file that motion to dismiss. OK. Now we have all the bail and bond things that happened. And now we get to September 14th and we see information filed. Mm. So we know that there's been an updated charging document. There's been updated information filed as of September 14th. Now, September 15th, we see motion for stay away order filed. So this motion was more than likely filed by the government requesting that an order to stay away from the victim and maybe her mother be entered by the judge. Now a stay away order is pretty much the same as an order of protection or a restraining order, right? And in this type of case, these orders are commonplace to protect the alleged victim. Now you see that that motion is set to be heard on September 17th, which is today at 10.30 a.m. You see, there's also a motion to increase bond. Uh-huh. So there's also a motion along with these new charges. There's also a motion to increase the bail amount set for today, okay? Now, when you look at a motion to increase a bail amount in combination with new charges being filed, you could legally say, well, 
that insinuates that the prosecutors feel pretty strongly about this case, right? They've added more charges and they're also saying we want higher bond. And we see a motion for continuance filed uh, and that just means that the case was adjourned to a new date. And then they have a status conference set for December 3rd. So more than likely what will happen on December 3rd is the judge will say to each uh, side of the case, are you ready for a trial? And each side of the case will have an answer. Now, it could be judge neither of us are ready. We're still in motion practice. I'm still responding to motions. Or it could be judge we are ready. Or perhaps one side of the case is ready and another isn't, right? There's tons of different outcomes there for a status conference, okay? So I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment, hop back into the chat so that I can answer any questions. Chief X, do you have anything you'd like to say about that disposition chart? Chief X, you muted yourself, so I can't unmute you. <laughs> okay, I'm unmuted. Um, no, I don't really, but um, people are saying that they upped the bail to uh, 46,000 um, just recently. Mm. So as I said, um, filing a motion to increase bail shows that they feel pretty strongly about the case. And by they, I mean the government. And uh, allegedly the judge agrees and bail has been increased to 46,000 or 47,000 based upon, you know, um, what numbers you're working with. So uh, that does say, yes, Chief. I'm raising my hand like I'm in class. <laughs> yes. like, you, you said you said government several times. Do you mean state? Or are you saying, what do you, when you say government, what do you mean? Oh, government means prosecution. Government means the state of Florida, okay? I use those terms interchangeably. So I could say government, I could say the state, I could say the prosecutor, and they all mean the same thing. All righty. So yes, that, that shows that they feel very strongly about this case and that the extra charges, the additional charges they have filed, in their opinion, has actually made their case more detailed and more uh, strong. Uh, so let me see. I'm looking in the chat to see if any of you have any questions about the disposition chart. Not charges, not uh, what I ate for lunch yesterday, the disposition chart slash docket report that we just looked at. All righty. I do not see any questions about that. So we're gonna move on into these charges. Now, I will say this. Um, someone gave an opinion about the prosecutor in this case. I will say that I do not recommend uh, giving your personal opinions about the veracity of either the prosecutor or the criminal defense attorney. And here's why I will say that. You cannot look at someone in a, you know, isolated court appearance and judge how accurate or how efficient of an attorney they are. You do not know from watching one court hearing with someone whether or not they are a good attorney. They could have had a headache, they could have had a bad day. And let me tell you why I know that. I know that because I have won cases against people who underestimated me. Because the first time they saw me, I had a headache or a stomach ache or whatever, right? So do not look at one hearing and see this, uh, this young lady, which I think the prosecutor is a woman, right? And think that you can now make this vast judgment as to how efficient she is. You may be wrong, okay? All right, and so someone says, so is the attorney from the mom or the state? Um, let me clarify that because I think I understand what you're getting at here. So the child slash victim in this case is not being represented by either the prosecution or the defense attorney. Now in the future, a guardian ad litem or someone of so, some sort could step into this case and kind of represent her interest but the prosecution represents the interest of the state of Florida. And that is how it works in every prosecution. A prosecutor is never representing a victim. They are representing the interest of the state or the United States of America if they are a federal prosecutor. Yes, because some people were wondering why didn't it say um, uh, polite versus um, the victim they were asking. So the state versus polite. Mm -hmm. I, I would have explained that, but whoa, I didn't know. I didn't know that's where we were. I didn't know I had to explain that. Okay, let's let's walk it back some. 
So when you're in a prosecution, in a criminal case, it is the place which the place in which you violated a law, allegedly, that is prosecuting you. It is not the victim prosecuting you. So it would be the state of whatever versus the defendant or the United States of America versus the defendant. The victim themselves is not the person who is going to prosecute the alleged defendant. And to uh, illustrate that point, a lot of times victims will not want to go forward with charges. Victims will say, I don't want to press charges. And the state will say, we don't care. We're charging the person anyway, because the state is not a, uh, an attorney for the victim. The state is the state. They are charging this person because this person violated their laws, not because of the victim in any um, special matter or manner. Okay. What do you think about that, Chief? Um, I totally agree. It sounds um, appropriate. Uh, people, a lot of people have questions, but most of their questions are regarding the charges. So if we'll wait for you to go over that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're, we're going to get into it. We're going to get into it. But I want to make sure that we understand everything else, because if we don't understand the state versus Michael Nowak, we're not going to get the charges won't make any sense. Right. All right. All right so let's <laughs> let's jump into the charges now. Okay, so we're going back to our same page here. See, the doctor report is down here. Now, if you scroll up, you see the charges. Now, I'm going to start from the portion of this that I know all of you are just absolutely dying to hear me clarify, right? I already know. So let's start from that portion, shall we? Down here at the bottom, you see the two felonies that were initially charged along with this misdemeanor. And here you see no action as the disposition. So people, no action is legally different from an outright dismissal. Let me explain what no action means when you're talking about a felony. So no action means that no further information was filed on those charges and or no grand jury action occurred recurring um occurred addressing those charges so it could either mean that when they filed the new information they didn't speak to those charges or that they did not take those charges to a grand jury of any sort okay so why is it different from an outright dismissal here is why no action thus far does not mean that those charges are necessarily dead now we all have the right to a speedy trial. That's a constitutional right. So depending on how much time the prosecution has left, they could decide to take further action on those charges if they still have speedy trial time. So that is why a dismissal is different from no action. A dismissal is this is dead, this is done. No action could be revived if you still have time left on your speedy trial clock, okay? So that is why there, it's a legal difference between no action and dismissal. Okay, so let's hop back into the charges now. So we see contributing to the delinquency of a minor. We've already addressed that. But here we see one, two, three, four new felonious charges. Hmm. So we see L and L mole child. What does that mean? We see L and L conduct child and L and L ex L and L exhibit. Okay. So L and L sounds sounds L and L stands for lewd and lascivious. And per usual, we are going to go onto online sunshine and look at the actual statute for all of the lewd and lascivious offenses and talk about potential prison time. Okay, we're gonna break it down just like I did in the very first video, okay? So before we do that, let me see if Chief X or any of you yes. have something about the new charges. Yes, Chief. Yes, so um, people are a little confused about the um, charges. Um, they, they, as she said, she are, they are still live. So which I think you're saying they can be visited or revisited throughout the case. Um, so, maybe some more information may come out during the process and they can revisit those. 
So what I'm saying is, and mind you, there's, there's two outcomes here. No action could mean that the government chooses to never take action on those charges again. It could mean that those charges are dead. However, it's not the same as a dismissal because it doesn't mandate that they're dead. If they still have time on their speedy trial clock, they could revisit those charges. That is why it's legally different from an outright dismissal. Does that make more sense? Yes, they seem to look, they, they have some clarity now. Um, so Nappy Yankee has a question we're going to address. Hello to Nappy Yankee, by the way. Nappy Yankee wants to know, is there a possibility that the two charges were dropped because Polite talked the mother down? If so, could the mother herself be pressured or catch charges? So to answer your question again, nothing was dropped. Dropped is not the right legal term to use because there is a difference between dismissal and no action. So dropped is not really the proper term, right? Um, is it possible that Polite has had contact with the mother? Who knows? I mean, maybe. There's really no way for any of us to know that. Um, could the mother herself incur charges? I think that's very unlikely at this point because she seems to have been instrumental in this incident being reported. And usually the law will view that as you did what you could as a parent. You took your child to report it, you took an action, okay? Anything on that, Chief? Yes. Yeah. Uh, people were, were questioning also um, the stay away order. And um, that's usually, I guess, put in place because to stop the interaction between Polite and the lady and the lady or child. Um, some say he's made some innuendos on some Instagram videos, um, trying to subliminally, subliminally um, communicate with the lady. And um, they're, they're just wondering, is that a reason why they may have a stay away order? Or why didn't they have a stay away order in effect previously? Okay. So quite frankly, with this type of case, if I were involved, I would have requested a stay away order immediately. Why a stay away order was not requested immediately, I don't know. But as I said, a stay away order in this type of case is commonplace. It is common to order that the defendant stay away from the alleged victim. That's that's typical. And a stay away order is pretty much the same legally as a restraining order or a protection order. It says stay away from this person, stay away from their home, stay away from their school, stay away from their work, right? Et cetera, et cetera. We good on that one, Chief? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so there's a comment that I wanna highlight. So, uh, oh wait, first, let me shout out the super chat. My goodness, how could I forget? Thank you, CJ, AKA, for the $5 super chat. We appreciate it. All righty, now we have a wonderful viewer saying the clerk's office says, based on the information filed on September 14th, that the state did a no action because they did not have enough evidence. That's possible. So pos it's possible that they took no action, as I said, because at this time they don't have the evidence. And depending on the time on their speedy trial clock, they may develop evidence and decide to take action on those cases. Or it may be dead. They may decide to never review or address those charges ever again. You never know. But it is legally different from an outright dismissal. Okay? Chief, you got anything on that? Um, no, I believe that is understood. Um, no one has any questions on that. Um, I have clarity. Okay, all righty. So per our last episode, you guys know that I do, uh, dove into each of the charges with an explanation of what the charges mean and the potential prison time for each of those charges. Okay, so we're gonna do that as well. Before we do so, Claymore has a good question. Claymore wants to know, does that mean that Polite also can't contact her through a third party? Ding, 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 Claymore. You might be the winner of the live thus far. I love thought provoking questions. Yes, when someone has a stay away order or a restraining order or an order of protection, that person cannot contact the victim through any means at all. They cannot say to Chief X, Chief X, 
can you tell her I said, right? No, they cannot send messages through other people. They cannot contact that person at all. At all. Okay. And if they do, that's cause for revoking the bail, correct? Precisely. So this is why Chief X is here, everyone. Give it up for Chief X. <laughs> Let's have a quick conversation about bail conditions. So usually part of the bail condition is that you do not commit further crimes. If you violate an order of protection or a stay away order or a restraining order, that is a crime. So yes, if a stay away order is issued and then Michael Nowak were to hypothetically violate the stay away order, that could be a condition for revoking his bail. Yes. We got another super chat. Hello to Queen's Throne, another awesome content creator here on YouTube. You should check her out. Thank you for the kudos and the compliment. It is well received by my guest and I. All right, so let's dive into my notes. You guys know I always make little notes for you and then I walk you through them, right? All right, so per usual, I have to announce that I'm sharing my screen. Why? I don't know. All right, and I kept it all in the same document. So you will see, well, you may see the prior charges as well as I kind of scroll down to the recent charges, okay? All right, you can see my screen. Great, let me take the super chat down. All right, and I wonder, should we make this full screen or would you still like to see me in chief? Let's see, that eh, doesn't make much of a difference. You can still look at us. All righty, so here we go in our doc. Let's start from the beginning, shall we? New charges, okay, so the new charges, nude. <laughs> the new charges are all lewd and lascivious offenses. Oh, you know what? I wanted to show you online sunshine. So you know what, we'll do it in reverse. We'll walk through this first and then I'll show you online sunshine. How about that, okay? Alrighty, so this is all pulled from the uh, state of Florida online sunshine statutes, okay? So this is directly from the statutes. And everyone, no one can pronounce the word except you, lascivious. Lascivious, it's lewd and lascivious. If uh, pronouncing words is not your thing, I would recommend doing a lot of reading. I did a lot of reading growing up and then words just became my thing, right? Um, and another thing you gain with that is languages become your thing too. So yeah, reading is great, it's fundamental. All right, here we go. So lewd and lascivious, a lewd and lascivious offense is when a person intentionally touches a blank, you know, I try to stay away from certain words, under 16 years of age in a lewd or lascivious manner or solicits a blank under 16 years of age to commit a lewd or lascivious act. Pause. So this means that a person does something intimately inappropriate to a minor or tries to do that via soliciting the minor to do those things. Now, the direct definition of lewd and lascivious is just wicked, lustful, unchaste, licentious, or sensual. That all amounts to intimate, right? The, the S word that we also don't use on this channel. That's what it all amounts to. Now, these types of charges are strict liability charges. For those of you who don't know what that means, that means that there is no reason that can be used to try to wiggle out of or defend yourself against this charge. When a charge is a strict liability charge, the only defense that really left available for the defendant is to say that it never happened at all. So one more time, when a charge is strict liability, the government is saying it really does not matter what your reason is for this happening. And so really the only defense to this type of crime is to say that the act never occurred at all, that it never happened at all. Let's get into it. So strict liability, lewd or lascivious conduct is a strict liability crime, which means it does not matter if the child's real age was unknown. So it doesn't matter if the, the alleged defendant did not know how old the child really was or the child consented to the conduct. It also does not matter if this defendant tries to argue that the minor said okay, or the minor consented in some way, okay? Neither of those things matter because it is strict 
liability. So let me look in the chat here, see if we have any questions thus far about that. Let's see, oh, we have a good comment here. So P. Fowler says, I listened to the case on Zoom. So sad he was still contacting the victim according to the prosecution. Oh, wow, horrible. So we have an allegation here uh, that Michael Nowak was allegedly contacting the alleged victim. Wow, okay, that that was not smart. If and, and that would be the reason that the stay away order was then finally requested. Yeah, that, that seems very dangerous and stupid to do. And, um, you know, but that's Polite's personality. He feels he can talk anyone into or out of anything. Yeah, I'm I'm taken aback by that. Um, I would imagine that his attorneys advised him not to contact her. That's that's what I would imagine because were it my client, that is what I would have done. So perhaps he went against the advice of his attorneys on that. Okay. Uh, some people, some people, <laughs> some person said Aku Kromanti said, "Is it even possible that it was the mother's shirt and scarf?" We don't know, you know, anything's possible. Maybe it was the mother's shirt and scarf. We don't know, right? These are things that we'll have to let the case develop. All right, so I'm diving for questions. I do not see any thus far. So Chief X, do you have any commentary or questions you'd like to add on lewd and lascivious conduct and on strict liability? No, the uh, I do have a question, but um, you're going over the charge in order and my question and some other people's question was why the charge was on there twice ah okay that is a very good question so let me give you a random example okay if someone were to rob someone right hypothetically you have um victim and then you have defendant and let's say defendant robs victim right let's say defendant takes a purse from victim, but also takes a duffel bag from victim. The prosecution could charge two charges of robbery. Why? Because there were two different items that were allegedly stolen. So in this instance, if the prosecution is alleging that they have multiple deposits of uh, bodily fluid, they could say, well, your honor, we're charging separate counts for each deposit of bodily fluid based upon some sort of um, theory or version of events, which would say that it was different actions that caused the different deposits of bodily fluid. So that's one way, right? Another way is perhaps the version of events that they received from the victim did actually involve four different actions. Perhaps within that one night, he did four separate things to this victim, allegedly, and each of those things account for each count of lewd and lascivious conduct. What you think, Chief? Agreed. Um, I, I agree with that, go ahead. <laughs> so you see the two ways, it could either be deposits of bodily fluid or it could be, you know, the victim actually recounted several different actions that occurred. Yeah, because some people were also thinking that possibly another victim came forward and that was um, another charge, but we see that's not the case. Right. I mean, you know, was that theoretically possible? Sure, but it doesn't look like that's the case. It doesn't appear that that's the case. Okay. Oh, I see a, a slew of questions in here. All right. So let's start just grabbing some. Let's see. Um, what happens to the question that I wanted? Oh, no. Here we go. Red Spot says, is it possible that the prosecutors are looking for other victims? Yes, it is possible that, as I said in my very first review of this case, that the prosecutors are trying to dig into this person's past, into uh, Michael Nowak, also known as, as Polite, to see if there are other victims. That is totally possible. Now, um, question, uh, uh, th that's similar to um, the Cosby case. Now, if they came across another victim, he's not charged in this specific case for that victim. So I guess the victim would become like a witness or a, uh, a testifier. 
That is correct. So if in fact they were to find other victims, which what happened to those victims aligned with what this victim alleges, right? Because remember, in order to get past the initial, there's an initial assumption in the court of law that something you allegedly did in the past cannot be used against you today. It's called propensity. So to get past that assumption, you have to establish modus operandi, which is a pattern of behavior. So if they find other victims who allege that, you know, uh, Michael Nowak did similar things to them, you know, and they can say, oh, I see a pattern here, then they could pull a Cosby. They could bring in these victims that they're not even charging him with. These victims are not even on the charging document, but they could bring these victims in and have them testify to show the court that there's a pattern of behavior here. Also in the chat, if you guys do type a question, um, can you use a question mark at the end of it? Very, very good, very, very good request. Alrighty, so I see someone saying, why did they drop the other charges? Hello to you, Tony Hayes. I see you just joined us. Go back to the beginning of the screen, screen. Go back to the beginning of the stream where we discuss what no action means. Nice to meet you, Tony. All right, so let's dive into potential penalties for these types of charges then, shall we? All right, so I'm back in the document here. Penalties for lewd or lascivious conduct, okay? So conduct by a person who is 18 years or older, right? That is considered to be lewd or lascivious conduct is a second degree felony. Let me pause for a moment. There are allegations that uh, Michael Nowak has come online to say that the most serious charges were dropped. Well, originally there was a first degree felony active on this docket. As we now know, the active felonies are second degree felonies. So technically, he's not necessarily totally off base with that comment, although it is a bit misleading in the way that it sounds, right? Okay, so second degree felony, punishable by up to 15 years in prison. So as you can see, the initial felonies were up to 25 years. These felonies are up to 15 years, however, do not forget that there are four counts of this felony. So when you do the math, the potential prison time is not different. Okay. All right. Punishable by up to 15 years in prison, 15 years of blank offender probation and a $10,000 fine. Under Florida's criminal punishment code, conviction of L and L without prior criminal history or other mitigating circumstances, carries a minimum sentence of 30 months in prison. So generally, it's a minimum of 30 months in prison. And at least two years, oh wait, Chief has a question. Yes, Chief? Does, with these four new charges, does mitigating and aggravating apply to these? So mitigating and aggravating, mitigating and aggravating applies to these charges as well. Um, as we've discussed on this channel before, mitigating means to make less, to make, so to make not as bad. Aggravating means to make worse, which means to make even more severe. Some mitigating circumstances in this case could be if Michael Nowak does not have a prior criminal history, right? That's considered to be mitigating. And perhaps if they can prove there are other mitigating circumstances, such as perhaps interactions between him and the victim, I don't know what those interactions would look like, right? And another mi mitigating circumstance that a lot of courts consider is whether or not that person, so i.e. Michael Nowak, was abused as a child. A lot of courts consider that when a child was abused, when they were uh, growing and coming into form, it's possible they may turn around and become an abuser. And so some courts view that as mitigating. So if, it, if Michael Nowak does not have a criminal record, perhaps has a history of abuse in his own life when he was growing up, things like that, a court could look at and say, you know what, we're going to not punish you as harshly because we think that these are mitigating circumstances. And in the state of Florida, I think before on the previous um, review you did, 
you said um, according to the state of Florida, um, if if convicted, you have to do the whole time in a case like this. There's no early release. But we're then- gonna get to that. So um, on our, on our doc, we're going to get into time. All right. So minimum of 30 months in prison and at least two years of blank offender probation. Okay. A person sentenced to prison for L&L is ineligible for game time and must serve the entirety of their prison sentence. One more time. Must serve the entirety of their prison sentence. So all the other ways in which inmates can gain time, whether it's good behavior or any other rigmarole they can do working for this uh, for this entity or that entity, those things do not apply to these specific charges. These charges, if convicted, you have to serve day for day, okay? I see in the chat there is something going on. Okay, you all in the chat, you need to be nice to each other, okay? You need to be respectful, or again, you're going to get put in the blockus, and the blockus is perpetual, okay? Now, back to the document. This conviction does render the convicted a blank offender, and the convicted would be required to comply with blank offender registration laws in Florida and throughout the US for the remainder of their lives. So if Michael Nowak is convicted of any of these four felonies, he would have to register as a blank offender and he would have to continue to do so for the rest of his life. Chief, anything? How does that affect a person's parenting? Wow, well, let's first talk about how it affects your life. Okay, so first things first, the blank offender registry is public because the government believes that parents have the right to know where these types of offenders are living. So the first thing is that wherever he were to move to, if convicted of this and if he had to register, of course, right, people would know that he's a blank offender and that he's living at such and such place. His place of residence would always be public. He could not try to privatize where he's living unless he were, of course, violating the rules, which if you want to know what happens when you violate the rules, check what's going on with Nicki Minaj's husband. Okay, So he would have to register, meaning people would always know where he's living and he would be restricted from living in certain places being in certain places, right? Places that are near schools, places that are near places where minors gather, he would be prohibited from living near or being around those places. It would undoubtedly change his life if he were to have to register as a blank offender. Anything on that, Chief? No, but somebody is is concerned um that polite um did travel um in and out the state or in and out the country um with the mother um i never seen the child with polite and the mother Um, but people were asking but it's not one of the charges the people were asking could they add uh um, transporting across straight state lines Yes. So when you want to add something such as transporting across state lines, such as in R. Kelly's case, right, you have to specifically detail that the conduct occurred. So you have to say that uh, allegedly this person transported this uh, girl for the purpose of doing this or that to her, or that while he was transporting this girl, he did this or that to her, right? So just traveling with this girl in general doesn't mean that any crime was committed. It has to be that the crime was committed during or in tandem with or in relation to the transportation of of the young lady. Someone's asking, can you speak to, um, regarding his presence in court, um, why didn't he or or did he not have to appear in court? And uh, I guess in these early proceedings, your attorney can just appear for you? So in case you all have missed it, we're in a global pandemic. I don't know, maybe you missed that. (laughs) But um, we are in a global pandemic and the criminal court system has also made adjustments due to the pandemic. 
They do not, they have stopped requiring that everyone appear in person all the time. They started restricting in-person appearances. They started doing a lot of electronic appearances. And also they've started to allow a lot of attorneys in lieu of defendant appearances. Got anything else for me, Chief? Um, that's about it. All right, I see a good question here. Someone says, what about the children that are in their custody? Assuming that their means uh, in the custody of Michael Nowak and his uh, girlfriends or, or wives, um, I think that the state of Florida would probably do their own investigation on that, right? Um, to our knowledge, the other children don't live in the state of Florida. We could be wrong on that, right? But public belief is that the other children live in the state of California. Um, so the state of Florida may do a quick inve investigation. You know, they have their own Department of Children's Services. So they may do a, a, an investigation to see, well, are there other minors uh, attached to this defendant that live in the state of Florida? And perhaps if they find that there are minors who live in the state of Florida, they may uh, restrict his connection to those minors, right? So they may say, you know, we're not sure that it's safe for you to be around these minors. But that would all depend on whether or not the minors live in the state of Florida, because if they live elsewhere, then that would be the problem of that state, right? Then California would have to deal with that. Chief, do you know anything about California Children's Services and, and how they do their, their, uh, their thing? Yeah, you know, I used to work at Edelman's Children's Court um, in Monterey Park, California. Uh, it's a dependency court, all forms of child abuse go to um, Edelman's Children's Court. And usually, I mean, I've never seen otherwise, but if a, if a man is convicted of a crime like this, um, children's services get involved. They, um, they take the children and, you know, it's about their safety. Um, the children are questioned and all that. So, you know, it's another part of this case that a lot of people haven't been talking about. Um, how does children's services play into um, police case? And, you know, I would think the children are not in the custody of Polite and his wife right now until this case is over. That's what I would think. But I don't have information on that. But that just seems like the normal modus operandi. <laughs> All righty, so I see a question from someone. Um, I hope I don't butcher your name, but Lanhala Gadi, Gadi, woo, hope I didn't butcher that. She says, insofar as someone who is not able to pay their bail or bond. So I'm assuming that you're wondering what happens to someone when they can't pay their bail. Go back to my original video on this case, my first The State of Florida v. Brother Polite video, which I think I'll put it in the description for you. So check back a little later. Um, and we have a bail conversation in that video. We also have a further bail conversation in uh, my video with Zion Lex, okay? All righty, so let's talk about online sunshine and the actual statue. Okay, so now I'm gonna share my screen. I'm gonna remove that for a moment. While I share my screen for the actual statutes, Chief, do you have anything that you just like to say to the audience? Anything you'd like to add? Yes, um, you know, I'm not an expert like you, but um, I think people's confusion with the sexual battery, um, I think may, may need to be addressed uh, because uh, people feel because she wasn't penetrated vaginally or anally, it's not sexual battery. But people forget oral is also included with um, vaginal and anal penetration. And um, on the police report, it does say he pulled out his um, blank and pushed her head towards it. So when, when, when we talk about revisiting the old charges, that could be a reason they could revisit it if throughout this, they found out that there was some kind of oral copulation, correct? Yes. So any type of inappropriate conduct with a minor is a crime in every state in the US. And oral contact is still considered to be inappropriate intimate conduct. It doesn't matter if it didn't involve the minor's nether regions, okay? I do wanna address this question here. So uh, true colors. Why is he still getting bail? Go back to my original videos where I explain bail. Bail has nothing to do with innocence or guilt. 
Bail has nothing to do with the strength of a case. A person is always assumed innocent until proven guilty. So that in itself should let you know that bail and innocence are not attached, okay? So you can go back to my first videos and it will explain to you what bail is and how bail works. I have two videos. I'll probably turn it into a playlist or something for you, but I have two prior videos in my coverage of this case. Okay, so let's go to Online Sunshine, shall we? I have it pulled up here. If you're new here, welcome. This is Online Sunshine. This is how you can view any law, any statute, any anything in the state of Florida, right? Before you, before you get started, I think people need to hit that like button. And if you're not a subscriber, I don't know why you're not subscribed yet. Just walk on over to the subscribe button and hit subscribe and follow Felicia Pearson, the wonderful Felicia, Felicia Pearson. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chief. And I concur. If you are not subscribed, go ahead and subscribe so you can get um, all of the legal content that I share on this channel. And also make sure you're getting notifications so you know when I go live, right? You know, I come to you with legal knowledge, with practical legal knowledge. And I also bring on awesome guests like Chief X so we can have conversations like this, right? We focus on logic here, not taking sides, not bashing people, not gossip, right? Logic, all right? Um, I see someone made a comment. Uh, so P. Fowler says, in the Zoom court this morning, the prosecution stated clerical error as to why he was out when he was supposed to have no bail. Okay, so this person is insinuating that they actually were in the Zoom meeting or saw the Zoom meeting somehow, okay? And so is it possible that the prosecution said that there was a clerical error as to why Michael Nowak was granted bail? That's possible, but that doesn't change the law of how bail works, okay? The state of Florida themselves have written several statutes that explain how bail works and bail still does not have anything to do with guilt or innocence. But it's possible that a clerical error could have occurred. That's totally possible, P. Fowler. Right, so I'm just scrolling for questions. All righty. So now let's, oh, Nappy Yankee. He says it. Thumbs up, subscribe, and share. So here we are in online sunshine, okay? Now I have actually pulled up the section or the chapter of the Florida statutes that deal with lewd and lascivious offenses. So this is a chapter here, everyone. They talk about the definitions and then they go into the actual statutes, right? So let's take it from the top. We're not gonna go through the entire statute because I already pulled the pertinent portions for you in my doc, but let's talk about a few of these definitions because I think a lot of them are relevant to what Chief has been saying. And before you talk about it, you know, um, I just wanna say to the audience, um, we're getting a lot of information here. We're learning a lot. Um, she's sharing her time um, and educating us on the legal process of this case. You know, um, she has her cash app. You guys should donate to this lady. Um, she has her cash app up and it's just a form of saying thank you for sharing with us in the community and keeping us informed. Um, I think she deserves, you know, send her a cash app. Be nice and uh, appreciative. Um, thank you, thank you, TFX. You guys know I was reluctant to start sharing my cash app because I didn't want people to feel um, pressured, you know? But I, I welcome any donation, whether it's a dollar, two dollars, whatever, you know? Um, you know, if you're choosing to give from your heart, I welcome that, right? Just know that and know that any amount is appreciated. You're not pressured, okay? Um, and thank you to everyone in the chat who's saying that they appreciate the information. I'm glad to hear that. That's why we're here. We're here for the edification of each other. When I cover these cases, it's not mean-spirited. It's from a place of edification. I want to see us more knowledgeable, educated, logical, right? Thriving in logical, rational behavior and not having conversations that are not at all rooted in, in the proper information. So that's, that's why I'm here. That's why I do this, okay? 
So online sunshine, the very first definition is exactly what Chief has been talking about. So under the statute of lewd and lascivious offenses, the person is being charged with blank activity. Blank activity means oral, anal, or vaginal penetration by or union with the blank organ of another. Okay? So all of those activities are included and covered by this statute. Okay? They get into things like victim, which we already know what victim means, right? They specifically discuss ignorance or belief of victim's age. So for those of you who might be unfamiliar with these types of charges, it is typical for a defendant to allege that they did not know the child was under age, right? But as we know, L and L is strict liability, right? So it doesn't matter if the defendant didn't know. Let's see what the statute says in particular. The statute says, the perpetrator's ignorance of the victim's age, the victim's misrepresentation of his or her age, or the perpetrator's bona fide belief of the victim's age cannot be raised as a defense in a prosecution under this section. Teaching moment. Here's a breakdown of what that means. Even if the victim tells the defendant that they are of age. So even if hypothetically somehow this victim told Michael Nowak she was 22, still wouldn't matter. Even if for some reason Michael Nowak thought she was over 18, still doesn't matter. It is strict liability. So those uh, arguments are not going to be defenses. He cannot argue not knowing her age or thinking that her age was something other than what it actually is. All right. I'm back in the chat. I want to see if there are any questions here. Huh, interesting. So Transparent has a good question. Let's let's talk about this. Transparent says, hey, what does it mean if proven not guilty and every content creator that gets proven guilty results in both or either civil or criminal charges of them on them resulting in shutting down of their channels, et cetera, et cetera. So what I think Transparent is asking is the potential of channels being shut down if they make a prediction as to this case and that prediction turns out to be wrong. Now, I have covered on this channel on several different videos what defamation is. Now, in some of my prior videos on Michael Nowak, I discussed it briefly, but if you really want an in-depth combo about what defamation is, you should check out my video on Candace Owens and Kimberly Klasik, or my video on Tasha K and Cardi B because Tasha K and Cardi B are having a litigation that directly refers to activity on YouTube, right? For defamation, false statement has to be proved. And a false statement is not an opinion. So just because someone has an opinion, as long as they present it as an opinion, that is not defamation. And that to my knowledge is not cause for having a channel removed, right? So an opinion on a criminal case not enough for having a channel removed. That is not in and of itself defamation. And if you want more info on defamation and public figures and all of that, revisit my video on Cardi B and Tasha K or my video on Candace Owens and Kimberly Plasic. All right, we got some super chats I wanna highlight. Let me go down to the first one here. Oh no, did I miss it? Did it disappear? Oh, here it is, Demetta. Thank you, Demetta. You are a queen as well, and I'm grateful to have you here, all right? Next super chat I wanna highlight. All right, we have a super chat from Suge, the king of content, sends $5 and says, what can I do about being falsely accused of being a blank by people like blank and other YouTubers? So here is what I will say to you, uh, blank, the king of content. If you have something that you would like to address with Chief X, I would recommend you do so directly, right? And if you feel that you have been defamed, I would recommend that you see an attorney, okay? All right, I'm scrolling through the chat. We have another super chat from B Buccaneer. B Buccaneer says, Chief X, do you think that Michael Nowak is polite 
real name. Oh, and quickly, Nappy Yankee says, is my cash app a little doggy? Yes, my cash <laughs> app is, my cash app is Felicia P. I'll put it up really quickly. And um, that little doggy that you see is actually my little baby Mac. If you're a newbie on this channel, you don't know Mac, but if you're an OG, you know, I have a little four pound Yorkie. Um, he's almost five pounds now. He's putting on weight, you know, pandemic fluff. Um, and he is just a little sweetheart. So yes, you'll see a cute little face. That is his face. Okay. And now, the let, me, let me answer that question for this guy. Mm -hmm. So he, people, cause people have asked that, um, is that his real name and does the court, this is court. Um, the courts and the law has been doing this for years. They know how to get a person's real name. When you even get arrested, you get fingerprinted, okay? Your fingerprints match up and they figure out who you are without a doubt. They would never make any kind of mistake like that in a court case having the person's name wrong. So Michael Nowak Jr. is his name. All righty. Chief X has spoken. We have another super chat, five bucks from GZ says, thank you for using your voice and online platform to inform and fight for uh, the blank or fight the blank of minors. Please report blank abuse. Yes, uh, if you have been abused in any way, I know it's difficult to do so, I know, but I recommend that you report it. You know, I know it's hard to do so. Also, people are, are um, and I don't know why people think this way, <laughs> but this is not, they're asking about, is it possible that um, she could have showed him a fake ID and that, that he, he thought, this is, this is not like some girl he meets on the street and she shows him a fake ID. No, he was dating and calling the mother of this child his wife. It's very clear he knows her, her age. So that wouldn't even be anything, you know, to dispute. So that's nothing to dispute because it's strict liability. So as we've discussed in both our little notes and also directly from the statute, right? This case, these charges are strict liability. So even if he thought she was another age, it doesn't matter. And let me tell you what the policy is behind that. The government views adults as responsible for who they choose to have intimacy with. The government views it as your responsibility as an adult to verify the age of any individual you choose to become involved with. So it is strict liability. Even if he thought she was older, it still wouldn't matter. Strict liability. And another guy says, nope, Polite mentioned his real name in front of the judge and it was not Michael Nowak. He said Michael e Eugene. So just for clarification, Eugene is his middle name. His name is Michael E. Nowak Jr. So if he just said Michael Eugene, maybe Polite is being tricky. <laughs> Oh, maybe, or maybe for some reason he wanted to clarify his full name. You know, perhaps they had his full name wrong and he wanted to make sure they had the entire name. You never know, okay? Black Anonymous says, shout out to Black Anonymous, by the way. He's also a content creator here on YouTube. What about jokes, parody, satire, etc., in regards to public figures? So as I've discussed in my, my videos on defamation, Public figures do not have the same degree of privacy as your average citizen. The courts view public figures as a lot more open to satire, parody, jokes, opinion, right? Because they view it as you've put yourself out to the public. You've decided to become this public figure. So people should be permitted to discuss you. That's pretty much, you know, common sense to me. And that is also how the court views it. Okay, so I am looking through the chat here just to pull some questions. In the meantime, Chief X, do you have anything before I pull a couple more questions and we uh, let you go? Not really. I'm just I'm just boggled why people are looking for excuses to um, <laughs> blame the girl or mother or, or was she wearing the mother's shirt and all these silly 
um, thoughts. <laughs> so I have an interesting thought for you all. Instead of becoming personally invested in a case that really has nothing to do with you, maybe if you were not personally invested, you could view it from a rational perspective. Novel idea, right? Do not become personally invested in these things. It is the state of Florida v. Michael Nowak, not the state of Florida v. you. Step back, be logical, be rational, and then you can view it from a, a impartial perspective. And you don't have to find yourself trying to finagle anything because you're just viewing it as an outside party, which is what you are, unless you are Michael Nowak. And if you are, huh, huh, we knew you were watching. All righty. Can't believe somebody's saying, how do you verify her age? We already discussed that. We've gone over strict liability so much that I'm a little concerned that so many people don't, you know, how many of you think that you might be with someone who's not the right age? Uh, you guys are making me a little concerned. I say that with love, okay? But I'm concerned, I'm concerned. Okay, so I don't think I see any other questions per se. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna put up this super chat and we're gonna say to our wonderful guest, Chief X, AKA the God best reincarnated. Do you have any last words for our guests before we let you go on about your day? Um, you know, I, I would like everybody to be not reactionary, but be um, rational. Um, you have to look at this stuff objectively. And, um, you know, I, I really, 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 really appreciate um, Empire Esquire. I highly suggest people subscribe and hit the like button and um, hit the notifications all. And feel free to subscribe to my YouTube page. It's called simply, it's called Chief X. Yes, I am subscribed to Chief X. So that in itself should let you know. If you we're gonna have a, we're gonna have a, a, a very deep history discussion tonight at 7 p.m. Cali time on my page, Chief X. Yes. So 7 p.m. tonight, California time. If you're Eastern like me, do your little calculations and figure it out. Um, but go on over to Chief X, subscribe, and set your notifications. All right. Bye, Chief. It was a pleasure to have you here. See you Bye, soon. lovely lady. Bye. All righty. So Chief X has left the building. I want to thank Chloe James for the super chat. She sends five bucks and says, if he has 100K stashed away, can he be deemed a flight risk? Yes, he can. He absolutely can. So if hypothetically, Michael Nowak does have access to $100,000 liquid, so not assets, right? But liquid $100,000 in an account where he can have access to it right now, yes, that can be used by the government to argue that he is a flight risk. And it may have been used by the government to get the higher amount of bail that they just secured. You never know. All right, so I'm in the chat, just scrolling through, picking through comments. I don't really have anything else in online sunshine to show you because as you know, we already went through uh, my highlights of the statutes. So not really needed for us to check out anything else there. So we're just gonna have a quick little combo and probably within the next 10 minutes or so, I'll go ahead and head off. If you guys did want to continue to see Online Sunshine for some reason, I am going to copy and paste the link, the actual link to Online Sunshine. And um, you can put that into your browser and check it out. You know, browse their statutes, okay? All right, we have another super chat here from N. Muhammad. N. Muhammad says, can we contact the state attorney to give them some info they may not be privy to that'll help their case? And would they look at his social media? So if you feel that you have information that the government would be interested in and you choose to share that information, then you are free to do so. Remember, the government is uh, supposed to be working in the interests of the people. So if you are a, a citizen who says, I have information that they should have and you want to share it, I'm sure they wouldn't mind that. Now, as to whether or not they're looking on his social media, I am almost pretty sure that whoever the assigned prosecutor is in this case has gone on to Facebook, Instagram. What else are people doing? Snapchat. You guys, I'm on none of these things, so I don't know. 
But whatever people are doing nowadays, TikTok, I'm sure they've gone on there and they're looking and they're, they're checking it out. I'm almost certain because most prosecutors would. We got another super chat from Jenna, ooh, Jenna Law. Hope I didn't butcher that. Says, great work, Empress. Thank you very, very much. All right. I am going to continue as I, as I always do, just scrolling through, checking out any of the comments and questions in the chat. Tony Hayes would like to know, if you were his attorney, what would you argue in his defense? As we've discussed, there really is very limited viable offenses to this sort of um, alleged conduct because it is strict liability. So really the only viable options left are to just try to argue that this never occurred at all. So more than likely his attorney will try to argue that this never happened at all. That might be his best bet because of strict liability. All right, everyone. So as Nappy Yankee said, be sure to thumbs up, subscribe and share. I'm